All right, guys. And I brought Dr. Jeffrey Mechanic back on to talk about the topic of the keto diet. Uh, I don't want to be left out here dangling by myself. I want you guys to know that I didn't prepare the doctor. It's a Sunday. And I asked him if he would stop what he was doing just to come on for a brief minute to verify some of the things that I'm saying. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. Doc, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure, Marcus. All right. So, you know, I don't want to attack people that talk a certain way. That's not my that's not my goal. And I won't get very far in my own personal career. But I want to attack ideas. And I say attack, I don't mean like warfare, like throwing challenge. grenades. Out. You want to challenge them. I want to challenge and debate them. And you, you've heard me speak, and you know that I speak in layman's terms. I'm not a scientist or a doctor. And uh, I think what makes me be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best people out there is I don't talk about science. I actually just, I, I, I reduce out the science, and I just look at the common sense things that I'm actually doing successfully and I actually call it what it is. It's at, my experiment is anecdotal on me. So I'm not going to write a book and say, you know, follow me. I'm doing it the right way. You know what I'm saying? All right. So first thing I'm going to jump into with you right away is the keto diet, the solution to mankind's problems. No. Um, first, we have to define what mankind's problems are, but I, I understand <laughs> I, I understand the, the hyperbolic nature of the question. Um, do, is there value, if I could maybe rephrase it, is there value or worth, is there benefit to, a, to an approach that takes on either wholly or even in part elements of the ketogenic diet? And um, the way that I typically address this uh, when people ask me is I actually have to reframe the question because everybody asks the question, uh, coming from a different place. And, and I think your introduction was spot on because a lot of people uh, come to this from the standpoint of an individual's testimonial, their own personal experience. As a physician, and that's the way I'm going to answer the question. So I'm going to answer it as a physician, not the two of us talking, you know, uh, about food and nutrition just casually. But as a physician, when a patient comes in and, and they ask me, what is the best uh, diet for me? First of all, we change some of the language. I like using the word eating pattern instead of diet. I don't uh, believe, or at least my approach is not that there's, that, that there's a good food or a bad food. You really look at the aggregate nature of, of what a human being consumes uh, over the course of a time period. That's an eating pattern. And it's individualized. Uh, Marcus, it depends on that person's background, their culture. So I've spent a lot of time, a lot of energy uh, academically and research uh, studying the way people eat and manage their chronic disease, particularly chronic cardiometabolic risk uh, globally in different countries. So, you know, you, you can't tell somebody in China or in Latin America uh, to not eat rice, not eat even, even um uh, white rice, glutinous rice, it's, it's their staple. You have to be appropriate to a person's background, their own culture, number one. Number two, every person has their own medical history and that's part of what we do. Do they have diabetes? Do they have obesity? Are they normal weight? Are they looking just for wellness and health promotion? Do they have gout? Do they have cancer? Are they, um, are they cachectic and losing weight because of cancer? So there's a, there's a context from that standpoint. Are they on different medications? So when, you're, when the question has to do with the ketogenic diet, there are interactions with various, uh, um, various medical conditions and, and medications someone's on. So it's not a simple question of, is there value or worth for a ketogenic diet? In, in fact, Marcus, there are certain malignancies where ketogenic diets have been shown to actually be tumorostatic, which means they control the growth of a tumor like in the brain, certain ones. Uh, there are certain genetic diseases or inborn errors of metabolism that are found in children where these ketogenic diets uh, tend to work. But what's happened is they've been discovered and they've been extrapolated and generalized. And here's where we get to your point. Unfortunately, they are espoused by people who practice quackery, 
and profiteering for their own personal use to tell everybody who comes in to use a ketogenic diet and buy my products. That's, I think, the context for your question, because those are the people that you're interacting with. Frankly, that's not part of the, of the answer, because I would just remove that summarily. I would say that no one should go to uh, somebody who's making money or profiting off of uh, selling a, a particular kind of diet that's for everybody. That, that sort of just defies the logic of, of human nutrition being individualized. Maybe I should frame the question differently then, okay. because I hear what you're saying. Maybe I would say to you is this, how about we talk about the average thing where I'm building uh, Nova's Ark, uh, the flood is coming, and I'm bringing uh, supplies for a wide variety of different types of people, Asian, uh, black, white, uh, whatever it is, we have a, a nice medley of human beings. In your experience, would the average person do well if they eliminated vegetables that were starchy and fruit and replaced it for several portions of animal protein every single day, regardless of what other patterns they have, their exercise? Let's say everybody was in pretty good shape. Tell me what you think of that. Right. So the answer is no, that would not be healthy. And let me just explain my answer. First, let me define what a ketogenic diet is, the way that you're describing it. And also let me define what health is because I used it in my answer. So um, uh, a low carb diet would be down to 40% of total calories is carbohydrate. American Diabetes Association came out with a uh, transformative publication saying that we actually recommend and, and believe that uh, low carb diets for the appropriate person can be beneficial for diabetes. They go on to define a ketogenic diet as a very low carbohydrate diet. So I'm sorry, not uh, 40%, it, it, could, um, it could go down to 26%. I'm sorry, it would be a low carb would be 26 to 40%, less than 40%. A ketogenic diet, very low carb would be less than 26% and typically containing 20 to 50 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, the history there is that a lot of people believe that was less than the requisite, the required 130 grams a day that the brain required for, for good health. So it was a little bit radical. And then the whole idea of a ketogenic diet, is the, the premise is that after a few days or so, a week, two weeks, as the ketone bodies rise. And this is what your body makes in response to starvation. Starvation is defined in terms of too low of carbohydrate. The brain adapts, can use the ketone bodies for energy. It suppresses appetite, which is a survival advantage. And people are able to maintain this diet for a period of time. Here's the problem. There are no compelling scientific studies. When you look at the weight of data, not an individual study, but the weight of data of strong, large scientific studies over a long period of time, five years, 10 years, that show that ketogenic diets actually have a health benefit, not in terms of kilograms or pounds lost, not in terms of a lower blood sugar or lower cholesterol measurement in the blood, but in terms of actual adverse events, heart attacks, strokes, uh, in terms of, of complications of these chronic diseases. That's what has not been demonstrated. That's what needs to be done. Over, it's overall health. What the ketogenic diet does on the glamour side when it's not being prescribed for a medical uh, remedy, what it is really is it's people trying to sell that they crack the code to losing weight really fast and it's going to be the greatest thing ever happened to you. And what you see, typically what I've seen, because I'm studying it from a commercial side, is that mostly everyone gets a good result because what the ketogenic diet gets them to do is to eliminate all the other garbage that's making them sick and, un and not you know, unhealthy. They're getting rid of you know, the cakes, the, 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 the cookies, the crackers, the sodas. They're getting rid of all that stuff. And they're really going into a purest type of diet, even though it's a flesh-based diet. And I'm suggesting that the positive results they get are coming from what they're leaving out, not from what they're including. And I've already watched over a short period of time the transformation that happens to people after 12 months or two years, 
first thing that you see clearly is mood changes, skin, uh, their, their smell. I mean, I know people that go, I used to train a lot of Equinox and I had friends that were on keto diets. The odor that comes out of the human body when a person is in such a high protein is, it's very, very, it's a very distinct smell. And then of course, over the long period of time, when they start to include, because they're human, they start to include the mistakes they used to make, eating late at night, bad food combinations, alcohol, you know, having those desserts, then they're really just intoxicating their body. There's just no way that that can be sustainable and not cause, uh, is acidosis a thing or am I making up a term? No, you're, you're correct. In fact, um, there, again, there are fears that have still not been fully substantiated in terms of risks of, of ketosis and ketogenesis, uh, like bone loss and uh, kidney stones and things like that. Um, but it's, it's unclear whether they're direct effects of high ketone bodies or, as you correctly point out, the, um, the undesired or, or indirect omission, omission of uh, n- nutrients and uh, essential nutrients that are in foods that are being omitted. Acidosis is typically seen in something called ketoacidosis which is generally not part of a ketogenic diet. That, that would be in somebody with type one diabetes where the amount of ketone bodies that are produced is so much, it completely overwhelms the body system to buffer those uh, keto acids. You generally don't see that with uh, uh, ketosis from a, a ketogenic diet. Um, but I, I think your points are, are good, but let me just play this little intellectual game with you for a second, Marcus. Let's pretend that it, it's sort of a, a pseudo, a fake straw man. Let's pretend that I'm giving an interview now on this podcast and you're a believer of ketogenic diets. Let's take the opposite view. You're the believer. Somebody, you know, right after this, so I got an appointment to get on and do a Zoom call with somebody on the other side. What would my response be? And it would be the same response, and it would in, it would it would argue about how, in my view, it's not what I do. One, in my view, it isn't based on on signs for long term. Two, and and in my view, it's not based on on a complications centric view. It's based on just these measurements of weight, etc. But, and here's a big but. And this is the reason why the American Diabetes Association embraced some of these lower carb eating patterns. There are some people slash patients who simply do not respond to the conventional uh, science-based healthy eating uh, patterns. And in fact, there are lots of eating patterns that are proven with a far more data than ketogenic. The DASH diet for hypertension, the vegan diet, which I know you're aware of, Neil Bernard's aware of, uh, even sticking to the dietary guidelines for Americans, Mediterranean diet, which is probably the best overall diet, uh, owing to primarily to the polyphenol content. But you could have a patient who comes in who is obese, with diabetes out of control, has tried all those things, nothing's working. And instead of just layering on medicine and medicine and medicine, or even thinking about metabolic or bariatric surgery, there is a role to temporarily try, not long-term, but to get started to induce a change in lifestyle with ketogenic diet. And for that matter, a um, uh, sort of a mitigated or attenuated intermittent fasting diet. These are not my go-to diets at the beginning when someone comes in. But remember, my responsibility is not to the, to the principal. My responsibility is to the patient. Uh, so that's what I would say. That would be the argument if I was on the flip side. Well, if I, if I had the cash, I would take somebody like you and I would ask you if you can do four or five uh, patient studies. I would say, t- try this, put this guy, just do, you know, uh, take someone who's overweight, who's struggling, as you said, and they agree, of course, to do it. And you could, you know, test their blood and monitor all the things that they're doing, especially somebody who's on insulin um, and put them on a juice cleanse. And don't worry about calories. Don't worry about numbers and just watch. And obviously the first concern would be they drop dead and you're going to be sued. But obviously I did a bunch of these in the parking lot, probably about 20,000 of these in 10 years. And 
the results were always miraculous. I didn't have any scientific way of recording data except anecdotally and saying, look, this guy stopped doing this. He stopped doing that and he's drinking juice and look at the results. Doctors, a handful of doctors that would watch some of their wealthy patients do this just to make sure they didn't kill them, um, were always astounded by, by the results. But I don't, I don't want to subscribe to any one particular diet because then it makes me sound like I'm pushing something. Instead, what I'd rather say is that the reason why fad diets become a thing is because somebody with a great education, maybe really even intelligent, someone with concern or care is listening. They got these big ears and they're listening and then they hear something. They hear something within the medical community and they hear a lecture or they hear they read something in a book and then they don't really understand the science, but they find a way to regurgitate it. Maybe they're practicing it on themselves. Once somebody writes a book about it, like I wrote a book called The Keto Diet, there's no way they're going to retract what they're saying three months later and take a plow off their wall. There's no way. They're going to they're gonna double down. They're going to write two books. And when I listen to a lot of people in your community speak, I ask them a question. It's amazing, the bullshit. They're like politicians, how they don't actually answer the question. They talk about this thing and that thing, and there was a study, and then this and then that. And they conveniently neglect the science they use later to defend, well, you know, it's not a double blind study and, and, and uh, you know, it wasn't peer reviewed. Well, how come you conveniently say that here, but you don't conveniently say that over there? My, my, my experience is the following. If a person does an extreme diet for a prolonged period of time, they, they might adapt. The, the human body is a highly adaptive machine. It's incredible. I mean, you know, someone could take heroin drink alcohol, uh, puddle water, and eat Hostess Twinkies and survive for an extremely long period of time. You know that, right? How does that yeah. happen? It's the, the body's an incredibly adaptive machine. But it's certainly not, if someone lived 99 years on that diet, you wouldn't write a book called The Heroin Twinkies Diet and say, that's the diet we're, we're supposed to follow. The main reason why people love the keto diet in their blissful ignorance, all due respect, no judgment, is it's extraordinarily stimulating. It's like drinking 11 cups of coffee. The animal protein, whether it's from fish, snail, uh, a roadkill, uh, venison, rabbit, whatever the source of the animal protein is, is much more stimulating than eating a carrot. And so what people are feeling is the literally the intoxicating effects of a high protein diet. And they don't know exactly how to pinpoint that. They just know they feel great. And that's why those diets become popular. And that's why people stand by them to the bitter end. And it's a mistake. And that's all. It's not my body. If people eat that way, it doesn't affect me one way or the other. I just want to be a voice of reason. Doc, should they lock me up in a sanitarium or am I doing good? So I, I, I agree with, with your perspective, but I would temper it. Um, I, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think you don't want to fall prey to what the people who um, uh, are pushing the ketogenic diet, it, it's not that polarized, this discussion. It, the discussion is if you're in the health field, which you are, if you're in the health field, you want to do what's best for your customer slash client slash patient, recognizing that everybody's different. And it's okay to have your own preferences. It's, I mean, your preference is, is really a vegan diet. That's your preference. Um, and the vegan diets are proven. They're proven to be very, very healthy. And people who are on vegan diets uh, have less chronic disease. And, and overall, through various metrics, they do better. That's science? But, That's science now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like double blind studies and, and peer reviewed papers? Yes. On vegan diets. Yes. Okay, sorry. Absolutely. I just got really excited. No, absolutely. Um, so there is a <laughs> body of literature that looks at a vegan eating pattern. Um, the question is, number one, <clears throat> it's just not for everybody. People just- It's hard. Like, some people like various animal sources of food. And it's hard. It's hard, especially if you've eaten that way your whole life to make an adaptation like that. It might be too restrictive and it might take too much discipline and someone not, might not- feel good doing it. And well, if they don't have instruction, it's going to be very difficult. Well, so it's hard 
but it's not that hard if you think of it in the following context. There's an old adage that tobacco cures cancer. <laughs> All right. So if somebody comes to me very sick, very sick, and 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 they're they have, they're normal essentially, if I come up with a recommendation that's evidence based, they're going to do it. So if I say that you need to, if, if somebody comes in and they have very bad hypertension and I say, you cannot add salt to your foods, you need to have a DASH diet, low sodium, you need to start eating a lot more plants. It's a plant-based diet. They're gonna do it. Their blood pressure is gonna come down. They're gonna be off a lot of medicine. They're gonna feel better. Same thing for diabetes, same thing for gout, same thing for obesity. These are all diet responsive chronic diseases. And a vegan diet is definitely one of the options. And there are some people that love it and they can do it, but it's not for everybody. And you have to have the ability to be flexible. So again, using your point about how malleable and flexible the human physiology is, that's the reason why you can take the template of, of some ideal diet and then tweak it based on what if somebody has food allergies? What if, what if somebody just has a aversion? The absolutely. I, I would, I would say absolutely. But what's changed, what's changed. And I'm just, a, I, I don't even know why I talk about this stuff because I'm not an activist. I'm not going to stand with a, a, a picket sign and, and, and protest anywhere, but what's changed what I've seen, because I research social aspects of diet to try to understand how humans think, because I want to be able to sell the right shit at the right time. Just being honest, right? So what I clearly see is that we are, what, what's made us such a durable creature is our adaptability. The guys that got stuck in the ice really long time ago, they said, we're eating fish. There's no, there's no vegetables. There's no fruits. There's no papayas. The guys that got stuck below the equator, uh, you know, they had mangoes, coconuts, avocados, and lettuces and things like that. Everybody's different based on that. What I see clearly, it's the adaptability that made us a robust creature. What I realized today then is that it's our adaptability today that's going to help us become healthier. We now live in a world that the waters are polluted, the airs are polluted, there's processed food that proliferated the planet. We have stress like we've never had before. We're isolated from communities the way that we were before. Our, uh, our belief systems are, are fragmented and, and spotty. Um, and so, and additionally, our meat-based diet, we'll say, has also, is also part of our problem of why the globe at some point might not be hospitable to life. So it would make sense that as a, as a conscious creature, we would get together and say, when you take human health and you take the cruelty to animals and the importance of preserving our habitat, those three things together might lead one to say a plant-based diet is the best. That doesn't mean don't snatch a fish out of the, out of the, out of the river. It doesn't mean you can't eat snails. You want to harpoon a buffalo once in a while, please leave the dolphins and the whales alone. They're very pretty and majestic. You know, you get what I'm saying, right? That's per I agree completely. And that's the reason why when someone asks me what kind of, quote, diet, I'll, I'll say it's a, a healthy plant-based diet that's balanced. And, um, and then we work from there. But you're exactly right. It should start off being plant-based. And then over time, if, if the person wants to go fully plant-based or, or vegan, that's up to them. If they want to introduce animal products, then it's a, it's a dialogue. There's a conversation because there are healthier variants of animal products versus unhealthy uh, types of animal products. So, um, you know, you could have eggs, you could have milk, you could have an occasional fish. Um, but there are reasons. One of, one of my approaches, and we've spoken about this before, is the power of explanation. If you can explain to somebody where you're coming from, so it doesn't appear arbitrary. And, and, I, and I guess the context for what, what your concerns are, Marcus, is rather than making this a conversation, and I know that you don't want to, making this a conversation of anti-ketogenic, making it more of a conversation of 
healthy, good for the planet, and all those kumbaya. No, it's just there's the, the paleo, the keto, the gluten-free, those terms drive me crazy because they're, they're stickers on everything. And right. what, what, what to me, in my mind, being a guy in the food industry that thinks about this shit, what I see they do is they hypnotize people back to sleep. People say, oh, it's keto friendly. OK, it doesn't make a difference that I'm eating nails and cardboard. It's keto friendly. I'll eat it. That's why I hate it. Also, I watch my mother, my father, my sister, countless number of friends and people I care for struggle with their diet because there's emotional and psychological components attached to the way we choose to eat. And once we get into a food addiction, whether it's for sweets or protein or junk food or eating out of sequence, eating at two in the morning, whatever it is, it's very hard to break free of that. Unlike drugs and alcohol, where you just quit and out of sight, out of mind, with food, you have to regulate it. So that well, means that- also an, an environmental component. So you, we're not all living, unless you know it's urban blight and you're really trapped in this, this structural um, problem that goes on in the country where you're in a, a, a drug environment where, where heroin is all around you. Right. Um, that's not really ubiquitous or pervasive around the whole country, fortunately. But, but f unhealthy food is. It's unbelievable. There, it's there unbelievable. Are food deserts. You go out to the Midwest and it's it's much worse than it is here. But even if you have the best intentions, you walk down Madison Avenue or you walk around the village and there's all these temptations. So that's what you're fighting. And, and frankly, you know, one of the things that, that I've written about is that from a medical standpoint, this does require the input from politicians, legislation, but also business commercialization usually huge huge from industry industry, industry. that's that right. that you you have to help you're the force multiplier yes you can change the way health is branded you need to change the branding of health that's not something that i can do as a physician that's something you can do the only the only way i could the only way i could do it the only right the only way that i could do it not being richard branson or elon musk if i had the money i'd spend the shit ton of money on this and uh, I'd be the richest well, Apple guy not, in the world. Because they're not. Well, maybe, maybe not it's not necessarily. Not. Let, let, let me say this. It's an interest. It's 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 a it's a subject that I'm passionate about and I'm exploring why I'm passionate about it. And I try to temper that because it's not like, uh, you know, a, 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 a a cow fell on my mom and killed her when I was a kid. And now I've got to get everybody not to you know eat cow. My, 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 my first and primary motivation is I, I'm trying to direct people's attention towards my retail store. Hey, guys, look, it's me over here with juice and smoothies and really good food, and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. I am highly sensitive to people's suffering when it comes to diet. And really what I want to do ultimately is just illuminate the space a little bit. I want to sell some of my wholesome products. There's no doubt you know, I'm not pushing pills or vitamins. Uh, you know, I have a very limited belief system in that, although I think probiotics that are good, uh, that have science behind them to some degree, I've seen a lot of people have dramatic positive changes in their, uh, you know, digestive tract issues. I've never seen anybody come back to me and say, you know, that vitamin C you recommended, oh my God, it changed my life or a multivitamin, you know, and those, th those things could work. I just think they work more subtly probiotics, I've seen a number of people have dramatic changes, like go from years of pain, being on every possible thing with nobody knowing what was wrong. I've seen, you know, more than a handful of people get on a good probiotic, take more than what was recommended and say, wow, my pain is gone. So um, I think there's something there of all the supplementation that's out there. Um, look, we can go on forever. And I know I promised you that it was a 15 minute thing. Do you have anything that you want to close with. And also, by the way, I want to just tell the people, why did I pick you? Who are you? You're just some doctor with some plaques on the wall. Did you not write a book called Molecular Nutrition? I did. Okay, so you got a little background. And also, um, is this one of the subject matters? Diet is one of your uh, passion points also? Right. So um, my career has morphed a little bit. I'm an endocrinologist. But I, because of my uh, work in obesity and diabetes and then cardiometabolic 
uh, risk, I, I started to enter into this field of lifestyle medicine. And we put together two uh, medical textbooks in that field. And the idea is that um, healthcare really needs transformation. I guess for the audience listening, you know, and you think about um, each of you when you visit your doctors, the doctors are, are practicing primarily what we call tertiary prevention, which is waiting and waiting and waiting <laughs> for a problem to happen. And um, there are a lot of reasons for that. It's not because anybody's a bad person, but it's economics. The, the government, CMS, um, although now they're paying for more and more prevention, in general, good, high quality, comprehensive preventive care is not reimbursed. So we don't have a structure system. It's changing a little bit, but imagine if we were so much better at, at primordial and primary early prevention to adopt healthy eating patterns, like what, what you're saying, Marcus, start to exercise earlier, particularly at school age children, children in grammar school and combating the pediatric obesity problem and all the, the onset of type two diabetes in adolescents and all of these kinds of issues early on, we would have less sick people. The Marcus, the analogy that I give is for those of you who are fans of Star Trek and, and other sci-fi, you look at those futuristic utopian societies, not a dystopian society, which we live in, but a utopian society. And there's no disease, right? You don't really see them going to doctors except after maybe trauma, starship crashes, or <laughs> they, get a, they get a phaser shot or something like that. But well, how did all this disease go away? And the presumption is, you know, I guess when Gene Roddenberry was coming up with this was the technology was so great, they could put in little nanites or have molecular medicine and, and treat the diseases. But what if, what if that utopian society 500 years from now really had its act together for prevention early on and only 0.01% of the population really had disease. They were able to identify genetically where the risks were, intervene and prevent, and, and acquired chronic diseases as a result of an unhealthy lifestyle, maybe on outlying you know, planets when you're just exploring them and you have tribal uh, behaviors. But uh, otherwise, this is the power of prevention. And, and frankly, Marcus, that's the context of what you're talking about. I think if we were writing a, a futuristic movie together, my future man, they're butt naked because they figured out that being naked uh, was better for the emotions and they just have great sneakers so that they can get around. And and the, uh, the iPhone 96, because ha being connected and plugged into information uh, proved actually a good survival tool. Um, but listen, I think it's great. I'm always really excited to have your perspective. I love when you go rogue and you start getting all creative on me. <laughs> Can I, you like challenges? Can I challenge you with something? Of course. How about in the, by, by fall, you commit to do uh, three months of plant-based only with me. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk it through. I'll be like your, Plant-based. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you're not a, a ravenous meat eater, right? So I, I actually need to do that. Um, there's actually something called physicianal, a physician personal behaviors where physicians are allowed to talk about their own shortcomings uh, to patients. Uh, in the past, we weren't supposed to do that, but now it's evidence-based. Oh, if you were my doctor, man, I would know every one of your, <laughs> every one of your problems. <laughs> and uh, I put on weight with the COVID uh, pandemic, as you know. Um, we've spoken about it. I put on weight. My eating habits have really deteriorated because of the late night hours and uh, not being able to exercise. So um, I, I would actually welcome that earlier than later. Oh, so so how long do you need to get ready? A month. Uh, I, I want to give you a month. Maybe after this barbecue coming up. But oh, okay, okay, fine. So I, I always like one, maybe. You know why I want to prepare you? But I would do it. I would do it. I really would. I want to I want to prepare you so that you don't feel uh, stressed because stress can actually bend the the results because you don't like it or it's stressful or I'm whatever it is. Not under stress. I have no stress. I work hard, but I have no stress. Wow. Well, that's yeah, probably I mean, why you tune into the science so well because 
your your consciousness is open. Yeah, I, I really it. This is it, it's it's pretty obvious why I am not as healthy as I should be um, because of just the work. It's just tangible. The work I, I have dumbbells here in my office. I have a fridge. My wife sends me salads every day. And I, I do my best, but it's not good enough. So you just got yourself into patterns that you talk yes. about. It's just routines. Exactly right. If I was in your office sharing the other side of the office, I would just drive you nuts. And no, I, would just, I, would, I would be healthier. I would, no, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would say, come on, let's go. Kettlebell time. Let's go. Push-ups, push-ups, push-ups. But that's push what people need. That's motivation. And there's actually yeah. something in medicine called motivational interviewing. So I'm actually pretty good at doing it for my patients, but you can't do it to yourself. You need... So, well, you can, some people can, but you, you, there is a role for that external um, uh, mentorship and coaching and motivation. Um, and, and that's part of this comprehensive approach, Marcus. It's not just about branding of the food and even the physical activity. It's the whole behavioral shtick that, that goes that's with That's the it. hardest part. It's the hardest part. It I mean, we're all, we're, all, we're all dealing with that. I mean, we're not... We're, most of us are not going to be yogi masters that just sit in lotus all day meditating with a smile on our face. We're going to get engaged and involved with distraction and nonsense and things that really cause anxiety to some degree. And the truth of the matter is what I've noticed is that human beings will become addicted to anything that makes them feel good, regardless of what the consequence is. And so, you know, if we gain pleasure from eating or from... From, from drinking or whatever the thing that we're doing, exercise, sex, spending money, whatever that is, we'll use it over and over again because we just want to feel good. So, that's, so called the, that's called the hedonic theory. Hedonic. Wow, there's a theory for that? There is. And, and uh, I'll give you the easiest example. People <laughs> who stop smoking put on weight because they have to supplant, right. they have to replace, H-E-D-O-N-I-C-S-E. -I, -C -I, right I wrote it. I wrote it, I wrote it down because I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that I'm a, he, I'm, a, I'm a hedonic. A hedonist. A hedonist. <laughs> it's like a nudist. Well, you, you, put, you put science on that. What I, yeah. I, come at, I come at it from being sober all these years and recognizing that, you know, the, the addictive behavior pattern for me has its root origin in, in localized anxiety that, st that stems from my childhood issues. Black and white, that's for me, I don't need to explore that philosophy. I know exactly what it is. And what I realized is I'm, I was habitually anxious as a child from say age three to age 19. And I picked up habits looking at the world around me, society, TV, my parents, siblings, uh, uh, institutions. And so what I'm doing as a 52 year old man now is I'm trying to break all those patterns. I'm trying to uh, get to the root of anxiety, notice it when it happens, not react to it, not need to open the refrigerator, not need to get in my car and uh, go buy something or whatever we do to reduce anxiety. The, the easiest solution is to sit through it and breathe and contemplate and meditate and change the pattern. And, and then it passes and it takes lots of practice, man. It's not easy. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do. All right. This is great. Thank you, doctor. I really appreciate your time. And I'm sorry to pull you away from your duties no, 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 on a Sunday. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.